if any of you came to the meeting to uh, <clears throat> learn how to solve PERS, I have a big uh, disappointing message to give you. We don't have the solution, obviously. So um, <clears throat> I think that the presentation that Paul uh, gave and then the project that uh, Tiffany just described to you gives us an idea of some of the things that we're trying, but this is still a very, very challenging disease, as, as you all know. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to cover four areas here, and Paul's done uh, covered some of this, and so we'll go quick because I want to make sure we leave plenty of time for some discussion from the, from the uh, audience. Talk a little bit about biosecurity, immunization, uh, exposure, and stable, stabilizing sow herds. And then I'm going to focus the majority of my time on air filtration, and uh, I think you'll see why uh, here in a minute. Um, you know, we think about biosecurity, we think about perimeter fencing, uh, we limit entries uh, of people, trucks, um, and then Paul used the term location, location, location. Um, if you have a farm that is uh, 20 miles from any other uh, pigs, you can get away with a lot of uh, biosecurity breaks, but in, uh, in, in Iowa, or particularly in north central Iowa, um, you, you, it doesn't matter a lot of times how good your biosecurity is, you're still going to have problems because of the way this virus is transmitted through the air. Um, <clears throat> all the biosecurity that we can put in place can go for naught if, if we're in a high density area. And the map that Tiffany showed, um, you saw that one uh, county in, in north central Iowa, that's Hardin County. Uh, and the county right next to it is where we have a lot of sows, and that's, I think, the number one county now for, for pig production. So uh, there are finishing barns around all, all of our sow farms. Um, the work that Dr. D, Scott D, did, has done at the uh, University of Minnesota, uh, you know, he sh first of all, he showed you could prove that the virus was transmitted two miles, and now it's four miles, and we just have evidence from uh, a project uh, in Nebraska where it appears that the same virus has traveled up to six miles with no farms in between. So sometimes we say, well, we have a farm up here uh, that is infected and we find another farm uh, a few miles away that got infected with the same virus and no <laughs> connection between the two. But you always have to worry, are there farms in between? In this case, there absolutely were no farms in between, so we feel fairly certain that that virus actually transmitted seven or six miles through the air. And then all of this, uh, we depend on people, and there's always the chance of human error through transportation, uh, violation of the clean, dirty line that, that Paul showed. All those are, are problems that we can uh, have to deal with. So can we immunize against this disease? Um, we have some very good vaccines for various diseases. Uh, we have not developed the perfect vaccine for PERS. Um, in the killed area, we basically have killed modified live virus vaccines. Uh, Bayer had a, a, a commercial killed vaccine that was eventually discontinued. We have uh, the uh, availability of some autogenous vaccines, those vaccines where uh, they take the virus from the farm and make a specific vaccine, a killed vaccine for that farm be termed an autogenous vaccine. Uh, there's uh, MJ Biologics, which uh, uses a method to uh, enhance the E protein, which is the attachment protein of the virus to the cell. Um, and it's a multivalent vaccine using a grouping system. So the vaccine may have uh, three, four uh, different viruses uh, in its makeup. The modified live, uh, Beringer Ingelheim has RESPERS and, and ATP, um, but all of these vaccines have met with marginal success because of the nature of this virus. This virus is an RNA virus. Another RNA virus that you all know very well is influenza. And what's, what's a characteristic of RNA viruses? Well, it's that they mutate very rapidly. Uh, PERS virus has a different method of of mutating, you don't get the reassortment like you do with, with influenza virus, but
but it still mutates very rapidly. And when it mutates, it, it doesn't have to change very much for that virus then not to be protected by the immune response that that animal or that herd has developed against the original virus. So, and the other problem is that we don't see good cross protection or 100% cross protection between these strains. So <clears throat> even though the vaccine works very well in a homologous situation where you get the same challenge with the virus that is in the vaccine, when you get different viruses, uh, we have problems. Um, <clears throat> so what do we do with these herds? Well, we can use vaccines, killed, modified, uh, or we can try to stabilize those herds using a technique that we call, some people call serum inoculation, or it's where you're using the virus from that herd, you're growing that virus up in a, in a pig or a group of pigs in that farm, harvesting that serum, and then going in and injecting all the sows and all the breeding stock that are coming into that farm for a period of time. And the, <clears throat> the idea of that is that if you immunize all of the animals all at once, you'll shut that, that uh, spread of virus down uh, quickly. Otherwise, if, you, if, if the virus just slowly moves through the herd, and in these larger herds, that's what happens, you just continually put out pigs that are shedding virus out into the environment. And, you know, this, this system can be um, uh, criticized from the standpoint that we're, we're using live virus, but in fact, I believe that we put actually less virus out into the community using this method than we do just letting it burn out by itself over time. So <clears throat> we're waiting for the biological breakthrough. Back when we were trying to deal with pseudorabies, we did have a biological breakthrough. We had very effective va vaccines that protected the pig from clinical signs. Uh, the animal could still get infected, but it wouldn't show clinical signs. DNA virus didn't mutate, and what the, the biological breakthrough we had was the ability then to have a diagnostic test that could tell you whether that animal was infected or whether that animal was, was just vaccinated. Today we don't have that. So it made our eradication program uh, much, much easier. So. We've been waiting for that biological breakthrough, and it, it hasn't come. And, uh, you know, we, we, we can only guess when it might come, when somebody really develops a vaccine that would, be a, that would work against multiple strains. So <clears throat> my personal opinion is we can't wait any longer. For those of you that have sow farms in high-dense areas, I think filtration, uh, air filtration, is, is the way to go. What's the disadvantage of that? It's very expensive, both expensive for, from the installation standpoint and you increase your utility costs because you're having to move a lot more air because you're restricting the amount of air that comes into that facility. <coughs> so this, I'm going to show you a group of slides here from our boar stud. Um, we sent Dr. Holcamp, a different Dr. Holcamp, Dr. Andy Holcamp, and, uh, and our, our uh, manager of all of our boar studs, Brian Qualley, to France to look at uh, systems over there where they were filtering air. And these are the, the kind of, and those of you that know Brian Qualley know that he is the most meticulous guy you can find in implementing a biosecurity program. And this is part of the biosecurity program that we had for that boar stud. It had a, a perimeter fence. Nobody got into that, that place without his permission. <clears throat> we had the first break. And, and that, if, you, if you think about going up Interstate 35, those of you familiar with, with uh, Iowa, uh, when you get up about, uh, uh, about to Dow's, the road kind of angles, if you look off in the field there to the right, to the east, you'll see the boar stud. It's just out in the field. And there, was no, there was no other uh, barns for a couple of miles originally. Today, there's, there's multiple finishing barns that have been built within a mile and one's within a half a mile. 
<clears throat> so that farm broke with a U.S. strain, uh, severe clinical signs. Uh, we weren't sequencing then. Depopped it. Uh, figured that it probably came in with, with a, a transportation failure uh, when we moved uh, new bores into that um, bore stud from the isolation. February 2002, uh, no clinical signs, but we uh, identified a Europers, a European strain, um, and we determined, or even though you can't always be sure of the smoking gun, thought it might be due to um, some movement again. 2003, severe clinical signs. So at this time, you know, we said we, we absolutely can't afford to have the, this bore stud breaking continuous like this. So we were considering building a, a bore stud completely out of the area. And that's when we sent uh, Dr. Holkamp and, and uh, Brian Qualley to look at the, uh, this filtration uh, technique. So <clears throat> I hope you can see these. Now this is a different system than what, if any of you are interested in doing something like this today, this is entirely different than what you would do. This is a positive pressure system. So these have big 20 horse fans that are pushing air through filters into the bore stud. Air from the outside, we have, uh, we're ex exhausting the air out the top of this building. And when the engineer was, when the f final, um, um, mock-up of this, the engineer was sitting there and we said, well, there's no chance of downdraft. And he said, nope, nope, this will stand 40 mile an hour wind. Well, guess what? It blows stronger than 40 miles an hour in Iowa. So we put these big fans in these stacks so that there's absolutely no way to backdraft down into this building. This is the filter banks, and I'll show you a slide here in a minute so you can see how we get into these. These filters on the left are, are basically the same kind of filters that you would have in your, in your, um, on your furnace in your house. They're just uh, to catch the big chunks, if you will. These filters are your secondary filters. Uh, these have been replaced one time, and behind these filters are, are the uh, filters that actually filtered out 99.9% .9 of the virus. No, no, no filter you can say is 100%. And those are the uh, HEPA, what we call the HEPA filters. These doors here are how we get in to, um, to, to uh, uh, monitor those filters. Uh, we have pressure gauges in there that tells us when those um, secondary filters, those first filters and secondary filters have to be replaced. <clears throat> Very expensive today. If we were doing this, we would not do it with positive pressure, but this was the first one that was done in the United States. We didn't have any model to go by, and it was very expensive. This is a 350 head bore stud. Um, today, you would do what we call a negative pressure system, and I'll show you some of those. This, this farm uh, um, is remained negative now for six years, and as I said before, we've got multiple finishing barns that are around it, so it's got a good chance of, of having PERS virus on its doorstep. <clears throat> Whiskey relaxes me. <clears throat> um, for those of you that know Dar Darwin Reichs, I. Uh, I borrowed these, some slides from him, and to me, he is the guru in this uh, negative filtration technology. Um, and, and I would suggest to anybody in the audience, if they're planning on doing this, you've got, you've got construction companies and people out here that are now um, offering these services. But what I would do before you would have a construction company design something for you, I would go to someone like Darwin and have him um, e evaluate the herd or the facilities and draw up plans because there's a lot of knowledge that has gone into this that, that uh, a construction company might not have. And he's not in the construction business, so then you'd have to have a construction company do the work. 
Um, Darwin's got 51 clients. Um, you can see the breakdown of the different facilities. Um, and of those 51, he's had two of those break, and they can trace both of those to a bio biosecurity breach where somebody has, has um, broken a, a rule. Um, originally, some of these, you can see these, they built these coffin, what they called coffin boxes. These, you're looking at the pre-filters on here. These are, again, like your household filters. Um, some, some people got real innovative and built these accordion-like buildings because you have to have a lot of air, you have to have a lot of filter space to get enough air into these buildings. So there's a lot of different designs that people have come up with. Um, <clears throat> AP has, has come along and developed this very nice uh, air duct box. So what you're looking at here is this box and looking down into uh, one of your, your air vents into your building. They, well, not, that's enough. Somebody said, you know, if you want to get rich, what you ought to do is go into the caulking business because you're going to use so much caulk. You have to, everything's got to be caulked and airtight because you can't have any air getting in that is not filtered. So now you're looking down an attic, through an attic, through the trusses, and you can see these, these filtration boxes over your air inlets. There's the filters and then the pre-filter just to, to keep them clean. And most of these attics, when you get up in these attics, they're actually fairly clean up there. So, you know, just uh, changing that pre-filter will preserve the integrity of your, of your uh, primary, primary filter. And you want to do that because these are very expensive to replace. Some of these now have been in place up to three to four years. And they're still, you they can send those in and have them tested and they're still at a fairly high efficiency. Another example. Okay, so the other thing that you have to do is you have to be sure you seal these buildings up. And you can see here's a door that's been um, completely covered with uh, plastic. Um, how do you get pigs in and out? How do you get people in and out? Well, you have to have some way of having an airlock type system. So normally you're gonna have to build a, a building that you filter the air in that you can put the, a load of pigs in or a partial load of pigs and you take those pigs out, close everything up, exhaust the air so you get enough air exchangers through the filter so that when you open it back into, into the building, put the next group of pigs in there, that's all filtered air. You have to be sure that you have no backdrafts. Uh, things you have to think about are, are um, getting backdrafts through uh, through louvered uh, fan louvers. They're, they've got uh, people have come out now with double louvers that are helping with this. This is just an example of kind of a. They just took duct tape, put this uh, uh, canvas on it so that if you, when the wind blows, it goes against that to hold it. There's a lot of different um, ingenious things people are doing to uh, try to prevent backdraft or, or any air getting into these buildings. So, can I have the lights back on? So, I, uh, and just in summary, um, you know, we, we just filtered our first sow farm, just completed that, and uh, we've got some Iowa Select folks here uh, in the audience that fight PERS every day, and they're looking for solutions, and I told our owner the other day, and unless somebody comes up with some uh, uh, a better biological control, I don't know how we're going to raise pigs purse free out of sow farms without without filtration. So I am a, a big advocate of trying to filter these farms. So.